Uh, so yeah, so what are we going to talk about? Uh, first, I, I want to start with a little bit of trivia. I don't want anyone to blurt out the answer. I just want a show of hands. How many people know what this is? One, two, three, four, five. Uh, it's maybe six, a half dozen of you. Out of, what do we want to say? How many are in here? Uh, 20 maybe? 20, 25? What that is... All right, so now I, it, for the very few drive-ins that are actually left in the country, you go there and they have uh, FM, uh, low-level FM broadcasts that you can just tune into and get stereo in your own car for the movies. But in the old days, it was this staticky, crotchety speaker that you'd hook into the window and roll it up. It had a little hook there to actually hook on it. Sound was horrible. It was obviously not stereo, but uh, that was the life back then. So... Uh, there, there are a number of things I, I want to talk about, and they actually more or less, more or less, uh, kind of all connect along the way or at the end. <clears throat> and the first topic that I wanted to start talking about was the Berlin Wall. <laughs> now, we all have a, a, a vague sense that the Berlin Wall had something to do with the Cold War, and it had to do with the Soviets building it. And uh, this happened after World War II. And unless you're a student of history, I think it's easy to kind of uh, think of it as being something that happened right after World War II. Beyond that, you don't know much about the Berlin Wall. What do we all know about the Berlin Wall? It uh, was a wall, and it was built by some guy named Irving Berlin. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <sorry. laughs> Uh, oh man, hang on. I, I gotta I gotta change my preferences here. I don't... All right, we're in business. We're in business. There it is. All right. So uh, the. The, the big takeaway I wanted here is, in fact, that uh, despite many of our vague recollection of the Berlin Wall being affiliated with the, the, the Cold War, uh, what some of us don't realize, because most of us slept through high school history, is that, in fact, the Berlin Wall was uh, nearly 20 years after the end of World War II that it was erected. And... Uh, so the next question is why the Berlin Wall and what precisely was it? And for that, we need to get a little bit of a geography lesson. So at the end of World War II, uh, Nazi Germany ceased to exist, and the Allied powers, namely the British, the French, and the United States, went ahead and divided up Germany uh, with the Soviet Union. And a totally separate partition included Berlin. And uh, Berlin, likewise, was separated into the, the Allied powers and the, the Soviets. And the interesting thing to note is that Berlin uh, isn't nicely situated on the border between what in this image is West Germany and East Germany. But in fact, Berlin was pretty far on the eastern end of Germany. So it's in the middle of East Germany. So when this partition occurred at the end of World War II, there was a, an implicit understanding that the United States would... Uh, be able to use rail access, the Autobahn, and uh, a series of canals in order to uh, get to and from the west end, the west half of Berlin. And um, there came a point not too long after the end of World War II, so World War II ended in 45, in 1948 then, uh, the Soviets decided that they didn't want the Allies to have that sphere of power this far in what is now in this image shown as East Germany. I keep saying it's now in this image because at the end of World War II, there simply was no German government. There wasn't an East Germany. There wasn't a West Germany. There was basically what had previously been Nazi Germany that has now been partitioned and is now being uh, operated by the, the, the occupying powers, essentially. Uh, and so the, the Soviets were uh, quite... Uh, not liking the Western powers being there in Berlin, way there in the east. So 
they went ahead and they cut off rail access, road access, and the canal access. With the idea being that without the Western powers having any access to Berlin, all the Berliners in West Berlin would starve, and they, to prevent starving, they would be forced to ask the Soviets for assistance in being fed and so forth. And this would then give de facto control to the Soviets for all intents and purposes, right? We'd have no power if, if the Soviets had this kind of power over West Berlin. Well, uh, the, the Allies would, would have none of this. And so, the, uh, again, this occurred in June of 1948, so just three years after the end of World War II. And uh, the Allied powers decided that what they wanted to do was to use air to supply West Berlin with all of its food and fuel needs. Now, that wasn't a, a small task at all. And the reason they went for air, so you may ask, well, why didn't uh, the Soviets cut off air supply? Interestingly enough, there was just kind of an informal understanding that they would give rail Autobahn and canal access to West Berlin. However, there was a formal standing <coughs> agreement that the Soviets would allow air access to West Berlin, this being arranged at the end of World War II. So uh, the Soviets didn't want to go so far as to actually renege on that agreement. So we began supplying West Berlin with supplies by air. Now, they had uh, quite a lot of needs. These are measured in tons. The, in West Berlin, in order to survive, so this isn't living the life of Riley, this is just survival. Uh, they would need 646 tons of flour and wheat, 125 tons of cereal, 64 tons of fat, 109 tons of meat and fish, 180 tons of dehydrated potatoes, 180 tons of sugar, 11 tons of coffee, 19 tons of powdered milk for the adults, for the growing kids, 5 tons of whole milk, 3 uh, tons of fresh yeast for baking needs, 144 tons of dehydrated vegetables, 38 tons of salt, 10 tons of, sh of cheese, and of course energy being uh, needed in great quantities, 3, 000, nearly 3,500 tons of coal and gasoline. And that all adds up to about 5,000 tons that was needed each and every single day. And the, uh, I think it was a C-54 was kind of the workhorse transport aircraft uh, that did the supplying, and of course it was supplied from the other Allied powers and their other aircraft, but to give you an idea, that aircraft would uh, supply 10 tons. So just by measure of that aircraft alone, that would be roughly 500 flights a day, not failing, right? And you got all kinds of weather happening. The logistical problems, uh, you can imagine, are just a nightmare. It isn't just simply putting planes in the air and landing them. You got to uh, keep the supplies getting to the p airports to get onto the planes. You have airplane maintenance. You have pilot uh, exhaustion. Uh, the, the logistics are, are just amazing that they did pull this off. And uh, here I, I step off a little bit to, to say a couple things. One is probably the uh, for any non-military person, the one thing that no one ever gives any attention to its logistics. The logistics of, of uh, supplying an army in peacetime, not to mention wartime, it's just uh, you know, an order of magnitude more difficult in wartime, but to supply a standing army is a logistical miracle that anything happens, right? These are people that are on the go, they're moving, they have equipment needs, and to, to keep all that supplied is, is, is mind-boggling. So my hat's off to the log logisticians. In, in the uh, military, in any country for that matter, for being able to do that. That is amazing. And it also, uh, I was asked if I was going to talk at all about conspiracy theories, and, and it did make me want to mention one thing about conspiracy theories. So taking 9-11, and not, this isn't a political talk, but taking 9-11, there are conspiracy theories out there that it was done by the CIA or it was done by someone, right? And uh, they'll point out there's this discrepancy, that discrepancy, this other discrepancy. Therefore, it had to have been a conspiracy. And my reaction to that is, OK, what I want you to do is I want you to sit down and develop a project plan for how you are going to pull off 9-11. Let me see you figure out the logistics for that. By the, if you did actually come up with a project plan, it would be a cast of thousands, the materiel and all that needed to actually pull off something like 9-11 much less it being totally secret, to me would be an impossibility. I would attack the, 
anyone who touts any sort of conspiracy theory like that accept their discrepancies and say, okay, show me what the logistical plan looks like and see if that's actually realistic to do something like that. Anyway, enough about that. I, I'm just a, a, a fan of, of logistics. <laughs> um, you know, I'm not very good at it myself. So, uh, so the, the Berlin Wall then went up in 1961. And the reason it was put up was that the Soviet Union generally, and Germany specifically, East Germany, was hemorrhaging people. No one wanted to be there. And, and so a, a, a fascinating, I love this picture because you get to see the dichotomy between West Berlin and West Germany and East Berlin and East Germany. And you'll see, of course, on, on the Western side, it's all graffiti and everyone walks up to it and kicks it and does whatever. On the Eastern side, you get within 20 yards of it and you're shot dead. And so it's perfectly clean. You can see what presumably are some military personnel on the other side patrolling there. Uh, just fascinating to look at. And uh, the wall is literal, it was literally a physical wall that completely surrounded West Berlin. Okay? So I, I didn't quite put the final period on the, the airlift. The airlift did succeed. That uh, airlift at it, uh, lasted a total of 11 months. And then the Soviets relented and once again allowed travel uh, via boat, rail, and autobahn. Uh, and um, I, 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 I got a chance to visit uh, West Berlin in the summer of 1990, or not 1996, 1986. So uh, it was a time, this was during the Reagan administration and the, the military buildup and the Cold War was getting hotter, a lot of tenseness and stuff. And one of the incredible things to me was just growing up as an American kid here, you know, it's really novel is to go to an air show and hear the loud jet fighters take off. My mind was blown away when I went to West Germany in 86 because I want to say somewhere between six and ten times a day there would be pairs or entire squadrons of fighter jets flying overhead. So West Germany was definitely a hub of the Cold War and this kind of standoff with the Soviets. And I, I don't think a lot of us had any idea of how serious everyone was about it. Um, and... Uh, I actually, uh, I did go to West Berlin as well. I'd met up with, just by chance, met up with a German family, and they had a series of motorcycle enthusiasts, and there's some sort of motorcycle conference in West Berlin. So they had an old VW bus, and I remember they're going, driving through East Germany in the middle of the night, just freezing in this bus, and then you get to one of the checkpoints to enter West Berlin, and, and it, was, it was just surreal. It was daylight with fluorescent lamps. Imagine half a football field, that's probably an exaggeration, just covered with a, a roof with nothing but these lights making it daytime so they can inspect your papers and so on and so forth. Um, anyway, it was, it was a, a, a very tense time. And uh, during, in, so it was certainly in 86, but, but particularly around when the Berlin Wall was built. And the in the late 1950s and early 60s, again, the Berlin Wall was built in 1961 is when it began to be built. Uh, the U.S. embarked on the Titan missile program. And you can see a couple of the Titan missiles there. Uh, they obviously contain nuclear warheads. Uh, you'll notice that there are some blast doors that are thrown open. So these things actually sit underground for protection, and then an elevator picks them up, and then they're fueled, and, and they launch. And um, it wasn't a program that was around for a long time. It was around from 1959 to 1965, so right in that point where the Berlin Wall was built. Uh, part of the reason for its short commission time is, one, advancing technologies, but also it took 15 minutes from the time where you turn the keys and press the right buttons to that thing actually getting up and being ready to take off. And a lot can happen in 15 minutes. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it was quite a program. So there were, um, this is a, a, a cutaway model of a portion of what these missile sites looked like. Uh, there were a total of, I want to say, 50-some-odd missile silos spread around seven different sites in the U.S., 
And this is just a portion of one of the sites. So any single site would have, I don't know, three, five, seven of these actual silos in it. And you can see there are underground tunnels there uh, connecting the silo with various control centers and so forth. This right, let me see if I can get a pointer up. That right there is a person, to give you an idea of the scale. Uh, each And what would happen is this, where's my pointer? Uh, tunnels would go off to a different set of silos and a different set of control bunkers and so forth. And each one of these sites, they excavated 600,000 cubic yards of, of earth. And uh, despite all that, they, the first one was completed in 15 months. So it's amazing how quickly they were able to do that. And that included a steel workers strike, which lasted 141 days during that time. And the steel was required because you needed steel rebar because all that concrete was reinforced steel. So uh, an amazing feat that they built this so quickly. This is what it looks like inside of one of the control rooms. <coughs> um, and uh, interestingly enough, in the 80s, I had a chance to go down in one of these. Not, uh, there, uh, I think they're, uh, they're one of them's a private home somewhere, and, and I think there may be museum, some turned into a museum. I'm not, I haven't followed very closely what's happened to them, but the one I went down to was abandoned. Uh, pitch black, so you had to bring your flashlight. All that, all that equipment you see went into a couple rooms like that. It, there's no equipment in it, but the shells of the, the framing housing the equipment was there, and it, of course, had been ripped off by vandals and spray painted on. Uh, but still, it was absolutely fascinating. Uh, the floors themselves were on these huge springs, probably, I don't know, springs a foot or 18 inches in diameter, real thick, with the idea being with the shaking of the launch of one of these missiles, that would kind of insulate the shaking for all these sensitive controls. And the floor was kind of ripped up, so you could see that. And you walk down these long halls that you, you see modeled here. And uh, it, it's as surreal as you can imagine in the middle of the night. And it isn't like a Disney ride where you come here to the little platform with the railing. What happens if you take one additional step as you fall? And these things were flooded with water, maybe to about here. Uh, so you'd look down, there was trash thrown in there, but it was clearly flooded. And you could look up, and uh, for those that were open, you could actually see the stars. And there was uh, kind of cabling, maybe half inch thick, kind of put in a web across this whole opening so that you could walk across it. Highly illegal, wasn't supposed to be there, but, uh, you know, hey, what are you going to do, right? You got to try. Um, <clears throat> And that's where, so some were asking me about the patch that I uh, have as a screensaver, or not as a screensaver, but as a desktop on one of my virtual desktops. And that is, this is what that patch is of. This is the 851st Strategic Missile Squadron. Uh, this is one of two squadrons that, who were uh, tasked with manning these Titan I missile sites and turning the keys if necessary and so on and so forth. And uh, the 851st Strategic Missile Squadron was responsible for three sites in the western half of the United States. And uh, I think one of the reasons why this is so interesting for me to be talking about all this stuff is that the closest one to us is just north of the airport. Okay. So it's on private property. Uh, we are, if you don't have your bearing on the map, we're down here, right? Chico State's down here. So you just drive to the airport and go a little bit north off Kiefer Road, and, and there it is. Um, it is private property. You can't get to it. This is a, you can go to Google and actually get the satellite images of it. This is just a small portion, so I was zooming up enough to be able to see something interesting. Uh, you don't want to go there and try and get in. This is all fence. And you can, imagine, uh, you can imagine being a college town, how many people would like to get in there to, to see it. Uh, so I can guarantee you that I'm sure the owner has 21st century surveillance technology, and you would probably get to the other side of the fence before you're caught. Uh, this is one of the silos. The, the doors are shut here. And this one here, the doors are open. And again, this is the, like the southwest corner of the Chico site, so it spreads above and to the right of this image here. Um, and in fact, this is the actual missile site that I had visited. 
And back when I had visited it, uh, the fence wasn't there and the surveillance wasn't 21st century. Now, a couple years later, I tried to go with some friends to see it and the doors down into it had been welded shut and we had to run like hell and some of us were caught by a private security firm. But that aside, <laughs> uh, it, was, it was definitely uh, an amazing experience to do that. And so the next question is, what was I doing in Chico snooping around this site in the mid-80s? And that's because I was a student here. <laughs> it's, uh, it looks like a Santa Claus white beard if I grow it in. Well, you can see the goatee is white. Um, and I had, more, you know, uh, it, the beard wasn't quite that thick. I've kind of got the hippie hair that's kind of uh, flanging out there at the beard line. So that's what you're seeing kind of at the edges of the beard. You'll notice that, that on the ID card, I physically cut away my ID because back in the mid 80s, your ID was your social security number. So you can, uh, that's definitely a nod towards how privacy concerns have changed over the, the intervening years. Uh, I was in the dorms here my first year. Is anyone in, in now or was in Lassen Hall? Okay, I was in the second floor of Lassen Hall. Uh, there's an old late. We'd go to Butte to eat. There's a cafeteria at Butte. No, is what's the name of the seven or eight story dorm? Whitney. Whitney. Yeah, you would go to Whitney cafeteria to eat, and there's a little old lady there who the first week would look at your card, say your name, and look at you. And by about the third or fourth week. You know, she'd get a thousand kids through there and be able to name every one of them without looking at the cards. So I'll never be able to do that. Um, and social security. <laughs> yeah, right. She made that. She retired early with all this. <laughs> um, towards the end of my stay here, I bought a computer from the AS bookstore. I bought it in November 29th, 1989. The Berlin Wall fell on November 9th. So 20 days before I bought this computer is when the Berlin Wall fell. Uh, figuratively, it physically was still there, but it was on November 9th that East Germany basically opened up the gates and allowed anyone to go to or fro. Uh, 920 West 4th Avenue. Anyone live on West Park Plaza, 4th Avenue near the railroad tracks? It's still there. So, you know, feel free, get drunk some night and grab some eggs and launch them at 2.39. You know, hey, it's unfair! And egg the place. <laughs> uh, so I bought a, a Mac 2CI. It had one megabyte of RAM. It did not have a hard drive because I could actually save money by buying a hard drive externally. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Had a floppy drive. Um, and the question is, um, how much did it cost? Now, don't blurt out anything. I'll give you an opportunity to, to give me an answer on how much my computer cost. Uh, to give you a point of reference, though, it's since you don't totally have to guess. So this was 89. What are we talking about? 25 years ago or so? Yeah. Um, in 1989, my tuition was about $400 a semester. Okay, so use that in your calculations. You want inflation adjusted value or no? Uh, I want the value that I actually paid. So let me bring this up. And uh, yeah, give me your give me your best guess on how much I paid for that that computer. Oh, do we not start? Wait, so we send it to 37607 and then we can go to the Right, yeah, you give this as the address. You have to type this as a code because everyone on the planet using this website uses this address. So you give this code, this is my, my survey, and then just give me a dollar amount below that. Or you can bring up a web browser. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know why they have those rules. No, just closest generally. You can be over. Uh, does that say show results? I can't see from here. What does it say? Cluster. 
Yeah, right. Yeah. One dollar, if only. <laughs> now there's quite a range. Seventy-five bucks yen. It was in. Grow, grown the beard back. I will. All right. All right. So let's see how much it was. Oh, it's not appearing. Where's oh wait there. So it's four thousand dollars. This computer is in my office. You can you're welcome to go in there and take a look at it. It was working completely as of earlier this year, but um, it's not reading the hard drives correctly now. I, I'm hoping I can clean out the circuitry and, and maybe it's just a short and it'll start working again. Uh, it has an RGB monitor. It, it's uh, about this big. The monitor is physically and it's heavier in hell. It's one of those old CRT things. It's about this deep. And that was, that beauty was, uh, how much was that? 670 bucks about. Uh, one of the, one of the, my former students uh, for whom I did this was doing the math compared with the tuition. They said, well, God, that's like buying a new car. And so let me introduce to you the 1990 Hyundai Excel. <clears throat> so you could almost buy a cheap car for the price it took to buy a computer then. No, you wouldn't be driving in style, but at least you'd be getting from point A to point B. All right. So I, I did get a hard drive. The hard drive was a, a 40 megabyte hard drive, and that cost about $600. I probably could have gotten it for 500 or maybe even 450 but I wanted top quality. So a top quality 40 meg hard drive was about $600. Anyway, um, yeah, there are distant platters. Mine was uh, physically about, I want to say about eight inches square. It's in my office. It's about this big square and maybe two inches thick. So it's, it was clearly an external drive, right? Um, anyway, uh, that is all I had for my madness today. A couple things I want to say is uh, one, Assuming you're going on to 211, you should definitely, 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 as hard as it is, try to do a little coding over the summer. It'll help you out so much. An easy piece of low frying, no, low frying, low flying fruit is to go back to the early assignments and projects of this course and just try to do them, right, without looking at your notes. And that'll keep your chops up. Uh, second, I do have to say in all honesty, I did really enjoy teaching you in particular this semester uh, that you all work together so much, the camaraderie I don't see in every class. So uh, that is something that I really groove on. So I'm really impressed with you all. Also, uh, I like to say that by taking a class from me, you get lifetime free tech support. So don't feel like you have to be in a class of mine to email me questions. I've been get, I got some 211 questions this semester. Uh, I've actually had people email me from 10 years back, so I'm not shy of, of you contacting me. Uh, feel free to stop by. I like to drink coffee. I'll walk downtown with you and get a cup of coffee. Um, definitely don't be scared just for the social visit. So with that, thank you very much. I wish you luck on your final and all summer long. Thanks.